Create content that attracts, converts, and keeps your ideal clients. This is Content Cells. Hi, you're listening to the Content Cells podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal clients. Welcome to episode 163. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co host, Michelle Felson. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Susie. How are you? I'm doing well. I have a slightly croaky throat, so I have to apologize to our listeners today. Uh, and as we record this, you and I are very deep in our preparations for our upcoming two day marketing success mastermind meeting, which I always love planning for these with you. I I love planning those as well um, because they're key points in the program where we see women make such great progress on their marketing strategy, on the way that they think about their campaigns. But also you and I are having a day of Michelle and Susie day because uh-huh. we are recording podcasts. We're doing strategy sessions for our masterminders today. It's one of the things that's yes. included in the mastermind. And so going deep one-on-one with these women. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the day, but I'm also really looking forward uh, to this episode. Um, so mm, Me too. We've got something special planned. We have a guest coming onto the show today, which I always love. I'm looking forward to this interview because this is someone I've heard this person speak on a stage more than once, actually. And other than the fact that he makes me laugh, um, Mm -hmm. he is just on the leading edge of thinking about marketing in ways that I have not thought of. And he's just innovative and, you know, he Mm. has a very specific niche that he works in, but I think everything that he's doing is going to be applicable to you, whether you are in the crochet um, niche or whether you sell courses or whether you're a stylist, all all of those things. Um, There's going to be great takeaways um, today. I know it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Now, our guest is named Will Hamilton, and uh, we've known each other for the past five or six years. We met in a mastermind group that he and I are both a part of. And, um, you know, like you, Susie, I not only love the mastermind format for our students, you know, Mm. we deliver masterminds to the uh, two people. I love the format for me. Mm. And I've sought out masterminds over the years years as a way to get uh, support, connection and growth that I was looking for. And I know you've done the same. And yes. what's great is we can bring these fantastic peers and colleagues mm. to this show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. I love that, um, our, that our network um, has been built on the masterminds that we belong to. And like you said, you know, we've got a few guests, not only just today, but coming in upcoming episodes um, and in past ones of people that who are, you know, world-class uh, that is exciting to bring to the show. Yeah. And speaking of Will and, you know, uh, you're right. When Will is talking, he <laughs> is someone you definitely want to listen to unless he's telling <laughs> jokes uh, and then you can make up your own mind. But seriously, even his joke, even some of his jokes are funny. Um, <laughs> uh, Will is a very, very clever marketer and someone that I admire very much. He sold literally millions and millions of dollars in products online. And when you consider that his products are often less than a hundred dollars, that's a lot of sales that he's made to get those numbers. So he really does know what he's talking about and he does a lot of testing and measuring. And uh, so he's a great marketing brain that we're able to pick today. Uh, His niche is tennis instruction. And in his own words, uh, this is what I asked Will for a bio and this is what he sent me. We teach tennis to adult recreational players who are brave enough to click a link that says fuzzy yellow balls. And of course, Fuzzy Yellow Balls is the name of his business. And he's created tennis instruction programs with the likes of Wimbledon champions, Martina Navratilova, um, the fantastic and great Aussie tennis player, Pat Rafter, and other tennis greats like Gigi Fernandez and the Bryant brothers. And he recently shared this new strategy that we're going to talk to him about today on a mastermind call that he and I were on. And I knew immediately Mm. this would be a topic uh, that would be a great one for our listeners. All righty, let's get Will on the line. Will Hamilton, thank you so much for joining us today on the Content Sales Podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I know Susie and I are both uh, very much looking forward to today's session. We're bracing ourselves a little bit in case there are some Will Hamilton jokes. <laughs> I mean, there's there's always jokes. I've been I've been holed up in a in an apartment for the last year just writing material. <laughs> so this is I'm debuting all of it. Uh, <laughs> great. We're not going to talk about any any 
anything that'll help with your business is just going to be one joke after another. <laughs> it's a stand up. Sorry, folks. You thought you were coming here for content marketing. No, it's actually a one man show, a one man comedy show. I got to get out and work out my material, you know? <laughs> Hey, listen, we, we do want to talk about some content marketing and you are doing something really, really cool. I hate to tell you, I hate to admit to you that you're doing something really cool, but you really are. And that is this um, amazing playbooks strategy that you have. You're really pioneering, I think, this space. Uh, but first, before we talk about that, just as a way of giving a little background for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about your very aptly named business, fuzzy yellow balls and how you've typically delivered paid content in the past to your audience to generate revenue. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, fuzzy yellow balls. It's uh, if you don't know what it is, it's a risky click, right? Um, <laughs> it's uh, you're not really a risky sure what click. You're, what'd you say? <laughs> you just say it's a risky click. It's a risky click. Yeah. You've never heard that term before. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Uh, it's, you know, you know what uh, actually really messes people up is uh uh, so it's, it's fuzzy yellow balls, but people will mix the order of the words up. So they'll think it's yellow fuzzy balls and then they go to yellow fuzzy balls.com. And that really is not a tennis <laughs> website. <laughs> so I would not write, like, don't go on a work computer. That would be bad. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we were coming up with a name. We just, um, we came up with a list of names. Most of them were lame. And then, uh, uh, we're like, oh, fuzzy yellow balls. That's the that's a tennis ball. It's a fuzzy yellow balls uh, ball. And my parents, I, we ran it by. I ran it by my parents, and they said, you absolutely cannot name yourself that. And then as soon as they said that, obviously <laughs> we're right. like, okay, well, we're gonna, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a rookie parenting move. Uh, so Did that's they never learn about made. reverse psychology. We say again. Did they never learn about reverse psychology? You know, they're very smart people, but, but people still have holes in their game. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they, they haven't figured that part out yet. So, um, um, but uh, yeah, so we, um, we've been at it since 2007 and we started creating uh, courses just like everybody else. I mean, courses is just sort of, that's the default, right? Everybody thinks course because, that's how we were brought up in, in school and in college, you're taking a, a, a class, a course. So it's just natural to think, okay, when I'm going to teach what I know, I'm going to, I'm going to create a course. And we actually, um, we created a, a serve course with a, an Australian national treasure, uh, Pat Rafter, uh, back in 2013. Um, we called it, uh, um, get your serve down Pat. Uh, we thought we were being clever, <laughs> but, uh, but it did really well, but, uh, Pat's a great guy. Um, he's an awesome guy and people, people love that course, but we, um, um, that one was very successful. We sort of, we probably created maybe 40 courses at this point and it, it was really wow. hit or miss where, uh, uh, you know, some of them would do great. And then other ones would, would sort of be like, eh. and when we would survey people, why they didn't get it, they would say, uh, you know, I haven't finished your last course or I'm busy, uh, or I've got something else going on. And we basically just kept running into this time objection uh, over and over and over. Where people were, were essentially saying one way or another, I, I, I don't have time to do this. And so when I was looking at that, I was like, all right, how do I make our content more uh, like a cookbook? Uh, because if, if you think of whatever cookbook, like your favorite cookbook you've got on your bookshelf right now, uh, let's say there's a hundred recipes in that thing. You've maybe only used five or 10 of them right. and you love it, right? You absolutely love it. You recommend it to all your friends, but you're only using 5% of the content in that thing. So it's, 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 and it's strategically designed that way. So you don't have to go mm. through all of it to get to the benefit. That's the other problem with the course is the benefit is at the end of a course. So if you're saying, oh, well, in three months, you're going to know how to hit a serve. People are going to say, I, they might even think it'll work, but they're like, I don't know if I want to invest three months in this thing. Mm. So how can you deliver, you know, a more immediate result in, in five minutes? And then if you can do that, you're removing that time objection and, and people suddenly get a lot more interested, at least in my experience. Love it. And this brings us to this, uh, the topic that we really want to explore today, and that is to learn more about your playbook strategy specifically. Could you give us an idea of what, what is a playbook? Because um, for many of us, it's a brand new idea. So what are they and sure. how are they different to what you were just talking about, which is what we know, which is a course? Yeah. So um, um, 
basically like a course has this uh, sort of big um, um, result at the end mm -hmm. and a playbook is, that, that people get and a playbook is, is the opposite. It's, it's niching something down uh, into a very specific targeted result. I think the best way to describe it, are you guys familiar with uh, American football at all? Not like really, not really, but keep going. <laughs> so, so, I mean, can but you I understand the idea of a play. Right. Yeah, can you yeah. visualize like an American football field? Like mm -hmm. there's a touchdown and mm -hmm. then people are it, – it, it probably – Well, you might have call? more luck getting us to visualize an American movie, you know, where the coach calls all the football players together and draws on a yeah, whiteboard yeah, this and says, is, this, this is actually, the play. Yeah, <laughs> so I, what's – what's a, uh, are you guys are you guys uh, Aussie rule football fans? You're talking to the wrong women. Okay. Totally. <laughs> football. Did you say football? Like anything before football and the answer is kind of like no, whether it's soccer, rugby league, I, Aussie rules, yeah. gridiron, yeah. it's no. Enjoy watching. Don't know anything about it, but, you know, okay. it's about well, the social uh, aspect. I'm going I'm to run with it and if it's unclear, uh, just just let me just let me know and I'll, I'll drill down. Okay, good. So, okay. so visually, like, you can Google it. Like what, is a, what does a football field look like? And so the goal for the team is to score a touchdown, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to um, move the ball down the field and then eventually uh, get it into the end zone, score, score a touchdown. And that's sort of like a course. Like the goal of a course is going to show you how to get this touchdown. But uh, a playbook, uh, a, a sports playbook, there's no play in, you know, a playbook is, is 100 plays or, or 200 right. plays. And the coach isn't necessarily using all of them. And, and the plays aren't, okay, here's how we're going to score a touchdown. It's, it's way more specific. It's how are we going to move the ball five yards down the field or 10 yards down the field? And if you can just do that over and over and over again, eventually you're going to get to the big goal that you want. Does that make sense? It does. And what I'm thinking about as I'm listening is, you know, there's different scenarios. So if this is the setup, if this is what's going on right now, then we're going to do this play. But if this is what's going on, we're going to approach exactly. it in a different way. Okay, got it, got it. And, and you're getting to a, a key point here is that um, if you, uh, again, you're visualizing the field. Now imagine the offense, that's you, like your team, you have the ball. And then the defense, the team that's trying to stop you from moving the ball down the field, that you can think of is the problem, right? That is the, the problem, the obstacle uh, you are facing. And the problem with, with how we've structured playbooks is the problem is always the same. You are not solving different problems. You are always solving the same problem. In this case, the de the defense, it's just a different situation, right? It might be early in the game it, or a different situation is it might be late in the game. You're at different places on the field. You might be ahead in the score. You might be behind, but the defense is always the problem you're facing and your goal, the result you're going for, is always the same. You are always trying to move the ball down the field. Does that make sense? It does. And if we're looking at business as uh, different to a sporting analogy, we similarly, we have somewhere we're trying to get. And so, you know, what are the moves that we need to be making along the way uh, to get there, knowing that this is the goal that we're going for. But to make it sort of a little more real for those listening, what are some of the topics that, for instance, your playbooks are dealing with in, in the world that you operate in? Yeah. And I, and, 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 uh, I want to clarify, like, as if you are thinking about building a playbook and I'll give you a process for this in a second, you need to identify in your market, like, what is that problem that right. occurs in a lot of different situations? And then what is that result I can deliver that is the same? So, um, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example right. from, from tennis and then we can expand. I can talk about it in, in other markets. Cause I've, I've helped some other people build playbooks awesome. in other markets. Awesome. That'd be great. Uh, but for tennis, for example, uh, in doubles, that's where you have like two, you know, it's you and a partner versus mm -hmm. uh, uh, another team of two people. The doubles playbook, which is our, our most successful uh, playbook, that's with with Martina Navratilova, the Bryan brothers, Gigi Fernandez. They're, they're uh, very famous tennis players. Mm -hmm. But the goal is, the problem is you are watching poachable balls whiz by you. And that basically just means you are at the net and you could get the ball, but you don't. And you watch the ball go to your partner, right? So you're missing these opportunities to basically uh, go get the ball. And uh, that happens in all sorts of situations. Uh, when you're serving, when you're returning, when you're in the deuce court, when you're at ad court, 
it's just a very common problem that happens over and over and over uh, over the course of over the course of a match. Again, in like very very different situations, same problem. And the result that we're delivering is to set up easy put away volleys and overheads. Uh, so and it's and it's always the same result. I'm always like, here's a situation. You're uh, uh, it's one up one back in the deuce court. One up one backs a formation. It doesn't really you know the details are unimportant, but. I'm just drilling down into a very specific situation saying, here's where the ball is going. So you would want to poach in this situation. And then you're, you've ended up now with an easy put away volley and overhead. Uh, and it's like a very, very specific result. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. It does. And you um, talked about having worked um, in other markets. So could you give us an example where the playbooks have been put in place in other markets solving different problems than perhaps the missing the the balls and having them go to your partner. Yeah. The one I was thinking of, this is not, um, this is not actually one that I've, I've specifically, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I was thinking like dating, for example, just cause this mm-hmm. is such like, uh, you know, everybody, everybody dates. So hopefully it, it's relatable, like the touchdown, right. That end result that a course or whatever, that big result everybody would want would be to be in a relationship. Mm-hmm. And we could actually go through the process basically is what is that end result people want? And then what you want to do, you got your big end result. You want to make a list of all the problems people run into when they're trying to get that result. It's just everything you can think of. You know, there's no, like, don't hold anything back. Just start making a list of stuff. And so, uh, you know, it could be, uh, I don't know what to wear. I don't know where to meet people. Um, I don't know what to say on a first date, second date, whatever. Like, you just keep making a list. So, one thing, this is if somebody is in the dating space and wants to make this product. Uh, one of the products could be like a problem you could identify is dating during the pandemic. Like that is a problem uh, right now everybody's facing. And then there are a lot of situations people would run into uh, 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 where um, that problem arises. So for example, dating during the pandemic, well, I can't meet someone uh, Mm. uh, in like that first date, maybe it's over zoom now. Right. Wow. So there, here's a situation like, Oh, I'm, 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 I'm on a zoom date now. So what do I do here? How do I uh, set up a bookshelf? <laughs> so I look smart, you know, the zoom background. <laughs> um, it's like, where do I get a library card? I have to take out all these books now and, you know, war and peace and great Gatsby. Uh, and then maybe the result would be for any of these like zoom dates or, or it could be like a, you know, another situation would be like a socially distanced date you want to make it fun and interesting. Like that would just be the goal. Like if you have enough dates that are fun and interesting, you eventually, you eventually end up in a relationship. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, um, um, not, not sure how well I explained that. The that, other, another okay. one would be like, so, if, if you have, let me, sorry, go ahead. And then I can give you another example. No, let's hear it. So it'd be like dog training would be another one. Mm-hmm. Um, like if you have a dog that doesn't behave, your dog does not behave in a lot of different situations. Like it's in your living room, like chewing on the couch or it's counter surfing in the, in the kitchen, um, <laughs> you know, trying to get food or it, it, it's, you know, uh, pooping on the carpet. I don't know. Um, and so same problem, dogs misbehaving, just a, just different situations, different rooms in the house, you know, barking at the mailman, whatever. And the outcome uh, you might be going after in this instance would be, uh, I'm just trying to get my dog to listen, right? How do I get them to, the dog to listen in every one of these situations? Um, so it's, it's, again, it's the same problem, different situations, and then the same result. And the reason you're driving towards that from a marketing standpoint is when you assemble a playbook, let's say there's, you know, there's 30 uh, plays in there. You don't have to call them plays. You can call them techniques, routines, drills, how to's, methods. I mean, you can name it, whatever you want, but the, the, when you demonstrate just one of them in your, in your marketing, whether it's sales video, whatever it might be, as soon as they see how one of them works, they will know how the entire product works. That's why you want to keep the result the same because you can just say there's 30 techniques in this thing that show you how to get your dog to listen. And so by, and, and that's one of the problems you run into with a course. People are like, I'm not really sure what this is. You know, like what, what, what am I getting? What are the deliverables? You show somebody one play, one technique, one routine, whatever you want to call it. It's a five minute tip. 
and then they know how the whole thing works. The, the analogy I always use is like walking into the supermarket, you eat a piece of cheese on a stick and then you know how the entire wheel tastes. Got it. Yeah, that's that's great. And and as with all like new concepts, and this is really a new concept, I think, um, in in this world of um, selling information and courses, obviously it's not a new concept for cookbooks. They've been doing it forever. Sure. Um, but in this particular space, it's a new concept. So I, I love that you're giving us these foundation ideas. And I think and the cheese wheel is a really good example of, hey, there's all these plays in the playbook. It's the rest of the cheese wheel. But if you just see this one play, how I solved the ball, you know, when the poachable ball goes past, how you solve it in this situation, now you know I'm going to be able to solve it in multiple other situations in a similar way. Yeah, that's 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 the trick. That's that's the main, like that's that's a key element because uh, like I said before, then then the entire product becomes very understandable. Uh, and yeah. the result you are delivering is very, that's, I mean, one of the reasons people like when courses would bomb that I created, it's like, it's a mushy result, a soft result, and people aren't really mm-hmm. sure what they're getting. And well, the advantage, with, hmm? go for it. I was going to say the advantage of the playbook is you can get so specific <clears throat> on a result, uh, like, a, like another one of our products. Like I just talked about the doubles playbook. I was like, I could get even more specific here. So I created a product called the little black book of tells. So a tell is just, it's like, it's, I used to play a lot of poker. So it's a tell is just like body language cue or something that tips you off about what hand they have. Right. And so uh, in the case of tennis, it's a, it's something your opponent does that tips you off where they're going to hit. So the, the result I set up was you will be able to predict where the tennis ball is going to cross the net like literally a snapshot in time, like visualize the net in tennis and where is the tennis ball over that net? Is it down the line? Is it cross court? How high is it? And so I I niched it down even more into such a specific snapshot that people can easily visualize it. They're like, oh, like tennis is a very complicated sport. You got to serve, forehand backing, you got to stay in shape. What do you eat? Nutrition, blah, 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 blah. I drilled it down to literally just where where is the ball going to cross the net? Mm. And that product crushed it. Because it was just yeah. so clear what people are getting. Exactly. And I want to dig into the marketing a little later in terms of like creating a product like this really does yourself a lot of favors when it comes to marketing the product. And, and you're alluding to a lot of that right now about mm-hmm. how easy it is to communicate what this is. But for the moment, I wanted to stay on this point that you just made about these kind of mushy course promises or really when we're selling anything, when we're marketing anything, these soft problems, these kind of undefined problems that we're kind of solving with these sort of undefined ways, that's really hard to cut through with any message. Um, And what I love about what you presented to us recently in the mastermind group that we're in together when you were talking about this concept was um, you were talking about this shift from creating products that have that, you know, have previously solved a very soft problem and delivered soft results. Now you've really, with this playbook idea, but I think it's applicable to all kinds of things, you've really honed in on this idea of getting very, very clear on a specific problem and offering a very tangible solution. Like that example you just gave us there with the tells, like Mm -hmm. that's super, super clear. And you make it really, you know, with the playbooks, ridiculously easy for people to instantly get the value of what you're providing. And I was wondering if you could, just because this is a new idea and it does help to hear things a few different ways and analogies often help. Can you talk about that process of getting clear on the specific problem and the specific results? Um, Because you talked about this um, GPS analogy when you Mm -hmm. presented it that I thought was really interesting and, and would help even if our audience isn't ever going to do a playbook, which I think you definitely want to consider doing that, but I think would help with really creating any product or any marketing promise, really. Um, How does this GPS analogy work for us helping us find these problems and results? Sure. Sure. So just, just to just visualize like a GPS on your phone. Right. And when, uh, whenever you're trying to go somewhere from like your house to, I don't know, like the, the opera or something like that, um, I don't know why I chose opera. That was random. I, I don't think I've ever been. To, actually, I've been to the Sydney Opera. Exceedingly random. <laughs> it's totally random. Well, you know what it was? Is I'm thinking of the Sydney Opera. That's what it is. I've, been, I've, I've wanted her. I didn't actually go to a show because I'm not that sophisticated. 
but I walked around it and it was very cool. <laughs> very pretty. Um, and I was like, wow, people who enjoy opera, this is a cool place to listen to it, but I'm not going to go to a show, but I'll appreciate the architecture. <laughs> uh, but, and then I went and started drinking beer. It was very, you know, um, <laughs> Okay, and Will's back. That's the Will. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I was, I, like, we veered into like content. I was like, oh gosh, I need to like work on some. That, that it's not even. I, I'm just winging this material right now, which is why it's not funny. Um, <laughs> okay, back to the GPS. Letters. No, we're only talking about jokes now. We're not talking. No, about no, jokes. back to the GPS. Bring the GPS <laughs> back, man. All right, all right, uh, <laughs> all right. So visualize. Yeah. So I'm going from my house to the opera, the Sydney Opera. And when you are trying to go somewhere, like when you're typing something into Uber, I don't, what do you guys use down there? Lyft, Uber? Uh, Uber. Uh, Uber, yeah. Like you don't put in like a, a, a neighborhood or a zip code. You put in like a really specific address. Like your house has a very specific address and where you're going has a very specific address. And so whenever I think about the product, I try and make it, at, you know, again, I'm, I'm not going to a neighborhood. I'm not going to even a street. I'm going mm -hmm. to a very specific address. Um, so I just always have that in mind when I'm trying, and, and that goes for both the problem and, uh, the problem you're trying to solve and, uh, uh, the result you're delivering. So from a process of like, okay, how do I actually find this? Uh, uh, I, I, the best example I can think of that's, that's just sort of one, probably everybody will be more familiar with is, uh, is pizza delivery. Like if you want a, uh, a pizza, uh, uh, like, like back in the 80s, you know, you guys know, you don't have Domino's down there. Domino's pizza. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, you do have mm -hmm. Domino's. Okay. So like back in the 80s, Domino's was brilliant, right? Because there was, uh, people wanted delivery pizza. And so Domino's, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if they actually did this. So I'm sure they did. But they made a list uh, or certainly heard back from customers of all the problems with delivery pizza back then. And it was like, well, it doesn't show up on time. It's cold. It's gross. It's stale. Um, you know, I just wasted all my money. So you can just, you know, they, there's this long list of problems with delivery pizza. And then, and then from that, what you can do is if you have this list of problems, what are, what's the antonym of everything on that list? In other words, like flip it so that you have a, a result. So like stale, you know, if your pizza is stale, the opposite of that is, is fresh. If it's cold, the opposite is hot. Um, and so you can go with all the things in your market, just create this list of problems and then reverse them to find the result. And what Domino's did was uh, their, their tagline they came out with in, in the 80s was fresh hot pizza uh, delivered to your door uh, in 30 minutes or less guaranteed. And that is all, you can see how they derived that from all of the problems mm. at the time with uh, delivery pizza. And that put them on the map. Like they were, uh, you're talking about a commoditized product like delivery pizza. And they blew up because of that simple slogan that was just brilliant because it was, it was so clear what people are getting um, and addressed so many of the various problems uh, people, people were struggling with. So mm -hmm. I, I think that one is a, is a pretty good example of how you can really drill down on, um, on, on a problem or, or use the list of problems to then drill down on a result. Yeah. And if we take it back to this, to your playbook idea uh, and something you said earlier, which is, you know, people, people have, um, they're all kind of aimed at solving a similar problem and getting to a similar result, but it's just in different situations, if you like, like a cookbook, mm -hmm. we're all hungry. And the end result is you're going to end up with a meal. It's just which particular meal will you make um, based on, you know, what you've got in your. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't actually, I use and how much time you have. I, I use the cookbook analogy because people get it um, in terms of I, it's sort of the way you want to think of the cookbook analogy is how your a playbook. People do not you need to use all the content. Like, of right. course, you have to go through the mm -hmm. whole thing to get to the result. In a linear way, usually. Just, right. Yeah. But beyond that, the cookbook's not the greatest analogy because like I'm hungry is a soft problem. And here's dent like lasagna is 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 um, I guess like. So it's, it's specific ish, but it's the, the advantage with the playbook is you can make from this list of problems, you can find a really specific problem mm -hmm. often that is not addressed by your market. Like, so for example, uh, your service slow is a really common thing in the tenant. Like I just don't hit that hard is like a really common problem that everybody addresses. 
but you watch poachable bulls whiz by you at the net is not like I went through that process and like, this is something people are not addressing. Right. So you, if you make, if you make a long enough list, you are going to find something that the market is not addressing uh, Mm -hmm. at the moment. And so you can create uh, to go back to the GPS analogy, a very unique starting point, like a very unique problem and then a very unique result. Um, this might be getting too much into the weeds, but I'm going to throw it out there just mm-hmm. because, uh, why not? So are you guys familiar with the five W's who, what, when, where, why? Sure. Right. So if you go back to the Domino's pizza thing, one of the things that was really smart about what they did is they use a couple of them. So fresh, hot pizza, that's what, like, what are you getting? And they, they were very specific. So they like narrowed it down. You know, it's not just pizza. It's okay. How do we get more specific, fresh, hot, uh, delivered to your door? That is a where, like, where is it going? Uh, in 30 minutes or less, that is when, and uh, guaranteed or your money back. That's off, obviously also what as well. So um, they, you can use the five W's to kind of look at your problem and your result from different angles and make it unique, right? A lot of people, I think people typically tend to think of the what, like that's the obvious, like I'm going to show you how to make $10 billion. Right. Um, and that's just the what, and you have a lot of other tools in your arsenal to, um, uh, to drill stuff down from there. I want to and, ask about that if I could, because yeah. um, you're, I love this, who, what, why, where, when, and how. And uh, well, the how is your solution. So that, so it's just the five W's, but the how would be, um, how do you actually do it? That's like your product. I must have too many. Um, oh yeah. The five W's. Yes. Gotcha. I'm just yeah. counting up my words there. Um, and so, um, so you've given us some examples, obviously in the tennis niche, but if we're looking at our community and we might have someone who teaches people to crochet or to run Facebook ads or have difficult conversations with their team or stay fit or whatever those things are, then is this the framework that you would use for them to really drill down to find the specific problems and solutions? Is it using this framework you've just given us or is there something else? I would do the exact, I would do the exact same thing. Right. Um, um, so like fitness, for example, mm. is a good one. Cause it's sort of, I've thought about this a little bit cause you do it. Like we have a product called tennis over 50. So, um, and it doesn't teach you all things fitness. It focuses on a very specific element of fitness, which is stability, which is basically the, the, your joint, like how does your, you know, you got the big muscles like biceps, abs, whatever. I'm not, you know, I'm not the expert in this, but, um, it's the, it's the connective tissue and like, how do you connect, get state, keep your body connected and stable. That's the secret to, uh, to, to playing tennis as you get older. So every exercise is focused on stability, right? So that the results always the same stability, 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 stability. Um, and then the problem in that case is once you turn 45, you learn, you lose 1% of your muscle mass every single year if you don't do anything about it. So that's the problem we've identified, but that's like specific, right? It's like, okay, like, you know, once you turn 45, that's a, when, um, you lose 1% of your muscle mass every year. That's like Mm -hmm. a what, but it's like, it's not like, it's, it's not like, oh, you're just weak or you're out of shape, you know? Right. It's a way more specific problem. And then stability is a way more specific result than you're in shape, you know? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, just on that, sometimes I think, and I see this in our community all the time, we feel like if I go too specific, then I'm leaving money on the table. And something Michelle and I are always saying is like, no, it's actually the opposite. Yeah, it's it is. by being broad 100%. that you're not speaking to anyone specifically. Um, and and mm. and sorry to interrupt, no, uh, go ahead. Susie. The uh, for, so from the five W's, the why uh, you can use is what I I sort of refer to as a connector. So if you are really specific, um, so let's say people want to like let, let's say people want to win more tennis matches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could say uh, in tennis over fifty, we are going to show you how to. Uh, these exercises are going to show you how to, and, and notice I'm saying exercises, not plays, right? So you can call them whatever you want. Yes, you don't, people get hung up and like, do I have to call this a play? You can call right. it whatever you want. Mm. These exercises are going to uh, show you how to uh, develop stability throughout your entire body. And then I throw in so that you can. So the so that you can is basically your reason why. So that you can, you know, play like you're 10 years younger or continue to win tennis matches or whatever, but I can use 
the so that you can or any connector. It's, it's really just the why connector to connect the narrow benefit to the big benefit that everybody mm-hmm. wants, the one that everybody's familiar with, right? So I could say like, we go back to like pandemic dating. I could say, I'm gonna show you how the blah, 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 this product, I don't know what it's called, um, how to date from your uh, living room over Zoom uh, with a dial-up connection. I don't know, this is a terrible <laughs> joke. Anyway, um, but it would be, I'm gonna show you how to have uh, uh, dates that are fun and interesting so that you can get a boyfriend or girlfriend, right? So I've connected it to the big result that everybody wants. Mm. I love it. I wonder because this is a a business owner audience and I know you, you know, have a lot of friends like who, like yourself, have their own businesses. So I'd love to see if we can give an example um, in maybe a different scenario. So say what I do is I, well, let's stay with that um, Facebook ad agency. I yeah, help people yeah. run more effective Facebook ads. How might I use a playbook? Yeah. So here, here's a, here's like a, a hack you can use. Uh, if people are like, Oh, I got to create like, what are my exercises going to be like, blah, 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 blah. What you can do is you can, you can uh, take whatever big result that you are promising. Like, so like people probably already have courses, right? So like, Oh, how am I going to like take my course and turn it into a playbook or a part of it? So what you can do is list, like, let's just say the 50 mistakes, the most common mistakes you see people make. Mm-hmm. And maybe like only 25, of a, like you know, 50 is getting a, a lot, like 25 to 30 is a pretty good sweet spot. Uh, but you'd have like, let's say 25 mistakes. And so, so you would say, all right, uh, my name is uh, Will and I help you with Facebook ads. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, inside my Facebook ad product name thing, uh, there, I'm going to show you the top 25 mistakes that people make when they're setting up their Facebook ads. Any one of these ads is going to be doubling your ad costs. And so uh, let me just show you one of them right now. So here's one of the mistakes. I call it a uh, crappy Facebook ad image. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, here's how you fix it, right? Uh, and so it's literally mistake fix. The framework is mistake fix. Right. And so you don't need to like do a, like a lot of, uh, uh, thinking cap work. Right? Cause I know like this is a new concept. You're like, Oh my gosh, how do I do this? Mm-hmm. I would just make a list of like the top mistakes people make. And then what are all the fixes? Got it. And then again, for like Facebook ads, it would drive towards like cutting your ad cost or getting like the perfect lead or whatever that result. But is. that result is consistent. You're saying through all the plays. Yeah, ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. So like, I'll give you, um, um, coming back to tennis, uh, just cause we have done this. Mm-hmm. So to go back to like the serve thing, um, uh, it's like, is your serve slow? And, and we niched it down. So like serve slow is like, you just don't have much power on it. The way we described it to make it very vivid is does your opponent stand inside the baseline to return your serve? Like it's, that's a bit like they're basically standing. So like inside, like your serve's so slow, they have to move forward into the court to, and like everybody knows that experience if they have a slow serve. So it's a very visual problem. But I say inside the the hundred mile an hour club, we're, we're going to show you the top twenty seven mistakes players make that are costing them five to ten miles an hour on their serve. Like any one of these mistakes could be costing you five to ten miles an hour on your serve. When you get these mistakes out of your game, you will easily be serving a hundred miles an hour or more, right? And a hundred miles an hour or more, it, it's specific. Like it's a very clear right. benchmark, like triple digits or not triple digits, but it's not like the most clever. Uh, result, but I basically just taken the mistake fix framework. And then if you do it, if you do it enough, it adds up to the result that people want. Got it. Okay, great. That really helps a lot. And I think that um, those listening yeah, I would, will be able to apply Yeah, I would that. recommend starting that way for a lot of people because it's very simple. Just yeah. list all the mistakes. What are the fixes? Where are people going? Love it. Thank you. Yeah. So we I took hope, all that. Um, we took like a half hour to get to that. You know, so I would just tell people, fast forward through the first 30 minutes, just watch this one minute clip, you're good. That's all you need. Uh, now you're underselling, you're underselling yeah, yourself yeah, because great. there is so much smart in what you're saying and what you've been saying about how to think about our product in a way that we can communicate it really well when we're marketing it, that our clients will really understand what it is. And it does require us to dig a little deeper. Like your phrase there about uh, does your opponent have to step inside the court to receive your serve? 
what's so clever about that is that it's really visual. Like I can see, I know exactly what that is because you've made it something that <clears throat> happens in the real world, not a theoretical concept. And I think you're super smart to do that too, because it also probably taps my ego a little bit. Like every time I serve and I see that guy step into the court because he knows I'm a lame server, it hurts my ego a little bit. And I want him to stand way, way back in the court because I'm about to slam that serve down. So you, you're building in some desire in that problem as well. That's, I think, really significant. So I just, I'm just, I'm picking some of that out for our listeners Um, because they'll be thinking about this. I think, how do I make my problem really visible, really specific, and perhaps even tap some of those underlying nerves that people have around, you know, the way they look or their appearance or, you know, the things that are going to really motivate them to want to have that problem solved. And you said something about, um, hey, maybe somebody's already got a course or, um, some existing content. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that just for a moment. Um, If I had an existing course right now, could I take that course and convert it into a playbook? How might, how might I go about that? You've given us the mistakes framework, which I think is great. Not all courses are going to be a mistakes framework. Say I've got sort of a few things going on in my course. What am I going to pull out of that course that could be good for a playbook? Yeah, I think uh, uh, if if y'all's folks listening have, have built a, a, a course like I used to build them, it's just like almost like a brain dump. You know, there's like so much stuff in there. Right. Uh, it just keeps going. It's 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 a run on sentence like the, the sentence I'm delivering right now. Uh, so um, basically, you could probably go in and like find like one module It's probably tighter and then what is that module doing for someone? And then maybe that is sort of your starting point. I mean, you, you would just take a very, you know, 10% of, of what your course is. And then the fact of the matter is like your folks probably have only been through 10%. I don't know how like you guys go through courses, but I'm like, yeah. I've gotten through maybe 10% of this. I'm good. I got the idea. Mm. Uh, like I read, I'm very good. I read like a third of every book I buy, I'd say. Um, well, every book I buy. You can often get the gist of it, though, in that first third. I often feel this, the last two thirds are filler. Yeah, they are. I'm also dyslexic, so I've been waging a war on books my entire life, you know? <laughs> so I'm more of like an audiobooks kind of guy. But that goes back to the bookshelf. Now I'm I'm screwed because what do I put back there during Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're typical, you know, I think each of us has that, well, I do a third or I do a tenth or I get the gist of it. Um, and so the way that you are setting up the playbooks mm. really is um, in response to how most people behave yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah, I think another way to think about it, uh, maybe you're looking at your course and it's like, what program, what playbook can I create where the, it, let's say it's video content, because that'll give us a, a timestamp, uh, where it's 60 minutes and that is it. Like, that's all you get. And every one of your how-tos, you know, your plays is three minutes, maybe five, but really should be just three. Uh, I have some, some of the, in the 100 mile an hour club, the serve one, some of them are less than a minute. It's just like, here's what you do. Here's the problem. Here's the fix. All right. That was 45 seconds you know, go try it out. Mm, mm -hmm. So I think maybe the way to think about it is less, what content should I, maybe the starting point is necessary, what content, but uh, uh, it would be what content can I deliver in 45 to 60 minutes might be the the better way. Cause that just gives you a a very finite container and then you kind of figure it out from there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Like, like when people go to YouTube, The first thing you look at is the title of the video. Like, is this addressing what I've just searched for? But the second thing people look for is always how long the video is. It's like, oh, this is seven minutes. I'm not going to watch it. I often go to the comments and look for where somebody will say, um, you need the bit at three minutes and 12 seconds. You know, like often people will take you to the place. YouTube comments are a cesspool of humanity. I can't yeah, believe you read those. I, I can't uh, read them either. <laughs> uh, I do. I, mean, I on read them when I want. Videos, when I want to know, like, how do I move that Photoshop thing so it's got a mask on it? And there's a video that tells me, here's how you remove the mask on a Photoshop image. Um, I want to just go to the bit where he says, click that button and do that. But they have two minutes of the intro and then they, you know what? I don't want any of that. Sure. 
I just sure. want the bit. So what you're saying is so true. And I think it this is also a big idea that I'm hoping our listeners take away from your brilliance today, which is if you can solve the problem in 45 <clears throat> seconds, why take 45 minutes to solve it? People actually value the brevity. And that's what I love so much about this playbook strategy. Well, I think the main takeaway is that you read YouTube comments. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, I do. I find them very interesting. uh, That is troubling (laughs) on so many levels. Well, you already know I'm troubling. So it's just add add it directly up to the the continued list. Hey, there's one last thing I'd love to cover with you before we go. Let me, and, that and, is, and let me just, and let me put a, yeah, oh. let me put, sorry, Michelle, I just wanted to put, um, to, to bring it, to put a bow on what I said, like right at the beginning where the number one reason people don't buy from you is always some kind of money. It's always a money objection. Um, doesn't matter if your thing's a dollar or a thousand bucks. The number, the second objection is always like a time objection. Mm-hmm. So if somebody, when you are delivering content, if you can do it in three minutes or less, you get rid of that, that that time objection is gone. It actually turns into a benefit. So I just want to emphasize how important the brevity of results is. Mm. You know, you might be an expert. Yeah. You might be an expert on a topic, but are you also an expert at teaching it quickly? And that is what, where a lot of people need to get to. Right. And is the brevity in the, it's really in the time it takes them to take the action that you've just instructed them to do. Well, the brevity is it's this is this is a three minute tip, and the and and someone's execution should be quick. Like they shouldn't be like I just deliver this in three minutes, but you now have to spend five years. Right. So it. they're both no, it's, br- you know fast action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It. It'd be like do ten push ups. You know, that's that's you know quick. Got it for some. The other, the I other can do way more than that. 10 push ups. <laughs> I can do more than 10 min- in a minute, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even contributing to this conversation because I still have to do my push ups on my knee. Um, I can do 10 on my knees in a minute. Um, so, uh, the, the other great thing, though, about this, this brevity of being able to get them to the, the inf- piece of the exact piece of information they need exactly when they need it which I just think is so brilliant, Will, and also the brevity of them being able to to implement that exact micro piece of information in a small amount of time. The the absolute knock-on benefit of that is that they instantly get a win. So they do their 10 push-ups and they go, right, I've, I've solved that problem and now I'll deal with the next thing. And breaking it down like that helps people to keep moving forward. When there's this giant monolithic course that's a billion million hours. It's really that's why we don't start. That's why we don't even start half of these courses because they just are too massive. So I really love what you're saying there. Piece of um, cheese on a stick. Piece of cheese on a stick. Have you finished tying a bow on that? Can I ask my next question? Uh, I sure. Yes. Yes. Please. <laughs> all right. This is one I alluded to earlier that um, all of this is great in terms of coming up with the actual playbook or with that sort of micro content that's going to have a really clear problem and a really clear solution. But where I think this strategy really shines is when you now go to market this product. And I think our readers are going to find, our listeners are going to find this really interesting, Will. Can you talk a bit about how you're using these playbooks on the front end of your marketing as a way to not only give people something that's really low cost and easy for them to say yes to, but how you're also using them as a, what's called a self-liquidating offer for our listeners. That is um, the sales from Will's Playbook are actually covering the ad costs to acquire those customers. So can you talk to us a bit about how you're using it on the front end and why it's important that it can be self-liquidating? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we tested, uh, 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 t- so the importance of a self-liquidating offer is you make your ad cost back right away. Um, and so that allows you to, uh, reinvest that money back into ads and obviously scale your business. You know, they buy that first thing and then they buy other stuff. Uh, the thing we found that was really interesting and we, we uh, uh, our best channel wasn't like Facebook, actually it was, it was YouTube uh, because there's a lot of instructional tennis instructional channels on YouTube. So we just showed them an ad for our, our thing when they were about to watch a video on how to hit a serve. But we tested a lot of stuff where, you know, like the traditional content marketing model is like, well, you have an ad and you send them to a lead magnet and then you get their email and blah, whatever. So 
we tested that first because it's just conventional. I mean, it's, it's, it's so conventional that it's almost like a course. It's like you just, oh, I need a lead magnet. And so we tested that. But then I, one, one day I literally, I woke up and I was like, I wonder what would happen if I just take my 23 minute VSL, my video sales letter, like the thing that sells the, the playbook. And I just make it an ad on YouTube. And I remember having a conversation with my buddy Scott about this. And we both kind of like, there's no way this is going to work. Like, like someone wants to watch a five minute, it's actually almost counterintuitive from a sales standpoint. I've just been talking about how you want to like keep things short. And then you're going to take a 23 minute video and put it in front of like a five minute video. Somebody wants to watch. And, and we're just like, no one's going to watch that. They're going to skip it, but I might as well test it. And so we threw that video up there and it cut our cost per acquisition in half. So in other words, there's no more lead magnet anymore. There's no, give me your email. And then I'm going to follow up with emails and send you to the sales page. And eventually you'll buy. It was just video right on Mm -hmm. YouTube being like, Hey, you should get the playbook. Click the link below. It'll take you to go buy it. And it it was just, it was just cutting out uh, steps Mm. people had to go through to buy the thing. Cause our, our, our price point for this is like, people are like, well, what should I charge for this? It was 67 bucks for the doubles playbook. And we try and keep it, our stuff somewhere. It's, it's basically cause all markets are different. I want a price point where someone's not going to have to think about it. Like they're not going to, you know, you're not going to follow up with an email or a deadline to like force them to a decision. They're just going to see it and be like, I want this. So that's how we price it, price it. Uh, and I mean like doing that by the doubles playbook has sold millions of dollars worth of stuff and it's just $67. Mm. Uh, so you don't need to have like a $2,000 thing to sell millions of dollars. You can do it at 67 bucks. I love that you're saying that because, you know, we all follow the online marketers who are doing the $2,000 programs, who are doing the multi-million dollar launches. And yet that's not the reality for most small business owners, but saying, you know what, you could just solve one very specific problem, sell something for, you know, under a hundred dollars and still make millions of dollars <laughs> and still, you know, grow your business and grow the impact that you're having on your, you know, your your own bank account, on your family, on the communities, on the clients that you want to impact. So I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah. We have loved having you here um, and hearing this really, really leading edge kind of concept. Um, is there anything you would like to leave us with? I almost dare not ask the question because it could be anything. I could. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I hate to bring this up. I have a great joke about uh, two sloths fighting, uh-huh. uh, which is like a very Aussie thing. But it's a, it's a. I have to act it out, so I can't tell it. <laughs> so I'll have to. I yeah. Um, um, it takes I'll tell ten you what minutes the joke is, to act it out. To, what you say? Well, I'll tell you what the joke. You tell us is, the joke. Then, We're gonna have to visualize it. Okay. You have to visualize because I can't leave the cliff, cliffhanger for people. But it's basically like I love Australia. The last time I was there, I. Uh, I saw uh, two sloths get in a fight. Uh, The fight took three hours. And then finally, uh, the first sloth knocked the second sloth out with this vicious right hook that the uh, second sloth never saw coming. But the act out is you have to visualize someone throwing a punch very, very slowly. Right? Yeah, got it. Yeah, it's hilarious. Do we have sloths in Australia? I, know, I hope Mary's so. Otherwise, here. he must <laughs> have been at like a zoo somewhere. <laughs> and and you yeah. know, I I love your style, Will. Telling a visual gag on a podcast yeah. by the best. Fabulous. We love you so much. Thank you so you much for being with ground. us. Otherwise, you know, you don't come up with new ideas. <laughs> you are brilliant, and this is uh, this is indicative of your brilliance. You are breaking new ground. This playbook strategy is great. We've so appreciated you sharing this idea on the show. I'm hoping our listeners are going to really ruminate on this. I know I am. Mm. And um, thanks so much for being with us. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, Michelle. (laughs) He is funny. I I mean, like, honestly, I just love telling a um, a visual gag on a podcast (laughs) that just... That just made my day. Uh, Just just for everyone's information, when when he really wanted to show us the gag as well, so we separately um, are going to get him on the line. He's going to show us the sloth joke. 
<laughs> on video. Hold the horses, yes, people. Absolutely. Like diary when this comes out, we all want to see. <laughs> we're demoing this love joke. Uh, but, you know, there were so many takeaways. I've heard some, uh, you know, I've, I've watched him develop this strategy. He's talked to us a lot about it in the mastermind, but I still learned so much today. These are big concepts that mm. uh, I think are actually rewiring our brains because like he said, there are so many traditional ways uh, we go about getting people into our worlds and they almost become habitual and not questioned. And he's really questioning at a very fundamental level. Mm. Like, well, what if I do put my whole sales video as my Facebook ad, my 23 minute ad ahead of a five minute video that somebody actually went to YouTube to watch and Hey, it works. So he's a bit of a mad genius mm. and uh, lots of takeaways. Mm. One thing um, that I think is relevant, no matter what business you're in, is this idea of figuring out the problem that you're trying to solve, mm. having all the different situations, all the different mistakes he called um, that um, you could fix, all the different problems that you could fix as part of your content, and then all leading to the same result, whether that result is your course or your consulting or something that you can offer. But breaking it down um, very, very specifically into small chunks, like he's not trying to say we can help you play better tennis. He's going very specifically for things like, um, you know, how to know if someone is going to hit the ball that way or that way or how to be able to foresee what your opponent's going to do. Just and he had some other examples there, but just same problem, different situations, same result. That's just a great framework I haven't heard before. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. And, and you know, taking that idea into the playbook concept of these bunch of, you know, this bunch of little how-tos that deliver very, very specific results. Um, and I love that you don't have to wait until the end mm, to get that result. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, the, the contrast between, say, the course and and a playbook. And and overcoming the time objection. I think that's a mic drop moment, really. Yes. Because time, I don't have the time or I haven't finished the last one that I bought from you or, you know, it, it is a universal objection, whether you're selling Facebook ads, tennis instruction, um, you know, in your case, Susie, building stronger businesses, um, whether you are teaching people to crochet, uh, that time objection is there and he's right. kind of come up with this universal way to overcome it. Uh, and I love the idea that people can just dive in and maybe they're only going to use a couple of the plays, but that's the exact thing they want at the exact moment that they want it and that's where the value is. Mm. And I love the story he told about Uber. <laughs> mm. And uh, getting back to that specificity, it's it's not like, yeah, um, just pick me up from somewhere, I'm going to go somewhere. It's a very mm. specific from and a very specific to. And I'm going to rewind and listen to that bit again because it was just very, 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 a really clever idea. Yeah. And, and with these kind of ideas, these new ideas, I think they do take a few listens and a few like mulling it over over time. And the GPS analogy is another good one to kind of keep mulling over that, uh, you know, as you said, the Uber analogy where they, uh, you, you, they're somewhere, they're starting somewhere. So you need to really be clear about where they are now. Mm. So that example of the person stepping into the court because they know your serve's not going to be very fast, that's where they are now. And then the result they want is where they're going, that specific address, and that is I want the 100 kilometre per hour serve. And if we can be clear, not just when we're doing playbook, but in any of our marketing with that level of specificity, we're going to get more results. And he said he's seen that in his own results and he's, you know, selling thousands and thousands of these. So his results are really tried and tested. And the other thing I wanted to point out was just this idea of having a self-liquidating mm. offer. And that idea may be new or that phrase might be new to some of our listeners or not, but that, you know, you can have a low cost something at the front end of your marketing that people will pretty much kind of no brainer buy. And um, in Will's case, there's $67 playbooks and it's covering the cost of advertising and acquiring that customer. Now Will's got other playbooks to sell them, other courses to mm -hmm. sell them, other high dollar programs to sell them. And he's basically acquired that customer for zero cost. And when you think about what it costs to acquire a customer, whether you do Facebook ads, you know, or paid ads or not, 
whether you know maybe you're going out to a lot of speaking engagements or running your networking breakfast or whatever it is, um, if you can find a way to get those customers at no cost, that's a huge deal in a business. Yeah, that's another concept, and um, we'll probably do a show all about that because mm. this idea of you know. Sometimes we think, oh, we've got to do the big things and charge the high prices. But what is something small that solves a specific problem very, very quickly for your ideal client that they would be willing to pay you for an amount that has you have like a limitless marketing budget because Mm -hmm. you're selling enough of these low cost items to cover all your marketing costs? I mean, that is the Holy Grail. So, yeah, that might be one for a future episode. Um, The other thing that I just want to mention um, before we wrap up is brevity. Brevity in the advice we're giving, in the coaching we're providing, in the tips that we're giving, but also figuring out how do we get them a quick win? How do we make the implementation of what we're teaching? Mm. Um, Because I'm one of those people. I've bought courses and not opened them yet. And it's not Mm. that I like to hoard courses. You know, I've got the information I wanted to buy. I don't have any regrets. I just haven't got the chunk of time that it's going to take to work through those courses. So I'll likely tap into them right when I might need that information. But if that hasn't been prepared for me in a way that is brief and that gives me the implementation quickly, then it's likely that I may never actually get the value that's buried in the long form version of the content that they've provided. And Mm. so, um, you know, even when he was talking about number of tips in uh, his playbook, it wasn't 101 ideas for running Facebook ads, you know, it was like 25 things that you could do. It's just just thinking that less can actually be more effective uh, in our marketing. Mm, such a good one. Mm. And the other thing was cutting out steps, and that's kind of brevity as well, making the mm. sales process more brief, right? So he talked about, you know, mm. I'm not going to do a lead magnet and get their email address and nurture them over time. You know, things that we do condone and that we do, mm. you know, appreciate. They definitely work. But we don't always have to do that. So we don't have to follow yeah. that road. We could go the road of the YouTube ad that sells the playbook, like you said, before I even give them the tip they came here to get. So um, just lots of goodness, you know, inside of that interview. So thank you again uh, to Will. We're going to put links and references from this episode over on our website at herbusiness.com forward slash Will, um, W-I-L-L, um, and we'll link to um, a place where you can actually see one of his um playbooks kind of in action. I think it's Mm -hmm. great to get an idea of how this really works and also ways that you can uh, contact Will, of course, as mentions. um, If we made any other mentions here on the show, there's other episodes that would be a good fit for you to also listen to um, to move this idea forward. Then we'll put those over on our show notes page as well and that's at herbusiness.com forward slash Will. And Susie, just that singles playbook um, example that you were mentioning, mm. um, for anybody that's listening, definitely do go over to um, that address that Susie just mentioned, herbusiness.com forward slash will, because there's a video link there to uh, Martina Navratilova actually kind of showing that singles playbook, what it looks like, what the inside pages look like, what the video trainings look like. There's actual footage of Will delivering these tips. So it's really something that you want to go and have a look at. And and you know, it's kind of a, it's a interesting concept, but I think when you can see it in yeah. real life, mm-hmm. uh, it'll really come to life for you. It's a very uh, exciting new strategy. Mm, very good. So we love sharing tips like those that Will gave here today with as many business owners as possible. So if you enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you would share the episode, but also hop on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating or a review. Um, in just a couple of minutes, you could tell us what you really enjoyed about the episode or just leave an honest review, whatever it is that you're thinking. We read every single review review and you might just get a shout out on the show. So uh, one person who's left us a great message is Esther Espinoza. She's one of our new Her Business members. I recognize the name. And she says this, she said, I started listening to the Content Sales podcast with Susie and Michelle. And can I just say it's brilliant, exclamation mark. I've binge listened while I filed at work yesterday. <laughs> I'm stuck on my ideal customer. So today I'm working through episode two and doing the exercise there. I'm hoping for clarity. And so she said, she She's very excited to discover her ideal client. And she's referencing, Michelle, episode number two. We're up to episode 163. But that is still one of our most popular episodes. So if you haven't looked at that one and you are also excited to discover your ideal client, you definitely want to have a look at that. So thank you, Esther. And um, we will put a link in the show notes to that episode uh, as well. All righty. 
one more thing I want to say is if you have questions that we can help with, if you have questions, whether it's about the marketing mastermind, whether it's about finding more of your ideal clients or creating the right lead generation or building your audience, you can always reach out to me and Michelle. We're available to support you over at the Content Sales Facebook page. So if you just head over to Facebook and you um, search for Content Sales Podcast, you'll find it. You can ask a question. We're willing and able to support you with whatever it is that you're working on uh, as best we can. All righty. Um, before we go, Michelle, what have we got coming up next on the show? Next, we have an episode that's all about wait lists. Now, for some of us, we may be using wait lists already in our marketing. So for example, you're inviting people to join up early for something before it's released. So you're building that audience of that hungry crowd, people waiting in anticipation for the release of your um, new product or when you're opening your website, your membership up next or whatever it might be. Uh, So if you haven't yet heard about this strategy, this could be exactly the missing link that you need in your marketing because you might not have your product ready yet. And you're thinking, how do I go out building my list when I don't have my product yet? Ooh, pay attention to this next episode. Wait list may be just the strategy you need. And we're going to be answering some questions around like how long should that wait list be? And what do I do with people between when they join my wait list and when when my thing is released? And the answers may surprise you. So check out the next episode all about wait lists and how to use them effectively. And that episode is coming up two weeks from now. So if you haven't already clicked that subscribe button, then go ahead and do that. That means you'll get that episode, um, whether you're on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you're listening, it means that you will get immediate access to that as soon as it's available. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go? A big thank you again to Mm -hmm. Will Hamilton. Just loved your generosity today, Will. Thank you so much. And for anybody that is remotely interested in this playbook strategy, definitely go and check out the show notes today, herbusiness.com forward slash will for that example of the singles playbook. Thank you for listening. We love putting this show together for you. We'll see you next time right here on the Content Sales Podcast. Bye for now.